Okay, I see people are introducing themselves in the chat, which is great. And uh, I also see lots of names I recognize here. So it's good to see everyone. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess I'll get going and hopefully a couple more people will trickle in as we go. Um, so as I said, I recognize lots of names, uh, but for those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Catherine Dale. I'm the coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. And with us tonight as well is my colleague, Jenna McDermott, who is the assistant coordinator and is going under the name Birds Canada Atlantic for the evening. Uh, so she is our tech master and uh, she'll be keeping an eye on the chat and uh, just hopefully providing any, any help if people run into trouble. Um, particularly with the sound clips that are in tonight's presentation. Okay, so both Jenna and I work for an organization called Birds Canada, which you may be familiar with, but in case you're not, uh, we are Canada's voice for birds. Uh, so we're the leading science-based bird conservation organization in the country. Although I always wonder how many of them there are when I say that. Um, and our mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation and conservation of wild birds and their habitats. Um, so obviously that's a huge job. Canada is a pretty large country. Uh, we have an awful lot of birds. And so one of the ways, really the main way that we go about meeting our mission is to um, have programs that engage citizen scientists. So people like you who uh, loan us their energy, their skills, their, um, their time to participate in our programs and collect data about birds. And so each year, more than 70,000 volunteers participate in uh, Birds Canada programs nationwide, which is just a mind boggling number. Um, just as an example of some of the programs that we are involved in, uh, this is, these are programs that are run out of our Atlantic office, which is uh, in Sackville, New Brunswick. Um, and so we have not only a wide variety of programs, but these programs also vary a lot in terms of how much um, experience you need with birds to participate, and also in some cases, how much fitness is required. Um, so that goes from things like Project Nest Watch, which is really simple. It's just, if you happen to see a bird nest, you can submit the information about the species and the location. Uh, you don't have to go out of your way. You can report the robin building a nest over your uh, cottage door, and that's, that's great. Um, and then that we also have things like the Maritimes Marsh Monitoring Program, uh, which involves a lot of skill in detecting cryptic marsh birds by ear and also an awful lot of wading through swampy water. Uh, so it requires a pretty high fitness level. Um, you'll see that our two Newfoundland programs, so that's the Newfoundland Atlas and the Nocturnal Owl Survey, are pretty much right in the middle there. Um, and so first of all, I'm gonna just briefly go into the Newfoundland Atlas for those of you who haven't heard about it. Uh, what it is, is a five-year citizen science project to map out the distribution and the abundance of all of the bird species that breed in the island of Newfoundland. So um, this is mainly relying on citizen science, but what we've done is divide the island up into 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares. And we are asking people to report their bird sightings from those squares. So the map that I have up there right now is for the great horned owl because owls are the theme of tonight's talk. Uh, and you can see those colored squares. So the red squares are where we know the great horned owls are breeding. Uh, the orange squares are where they are probably breeding and the yellow squares are where they're possibly breeding. Uh, so uh, the coloration depends on how confident we are that the bird is breeding there. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about the Atlas and how you can participate, we are doing an Atlas focused uh, webinar on April the 17th. So you can join us for that and we will talk about the Atlas in great detail. But the focus of tonight's program is the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, so this was started here in Newfoundland in 2018. Um, and we have grown pretty substantially over the, the past, uh, I guess, five years now. Um, but basically, it's a citizen science survey that takes place for uh, just you go just one evening between the 1st of April and the 15th of May. So we are coming right up on owl season. And I will go into more detail about the nocturnal owl survey uh, later in this talk and how you participate. Um, but I will just say the nocturnal owl survey is kind of a nice um, survey because it doesn't require a whole lot of fitness in terms of um, being a roadside survey. So you're just getting in and out of your car. And it also doesn't require uh, incredible familiarity with birdsong because we don't have that many species of nocturnal owls in the province. 
Um, before I go any further, I would just like to say that both the Breeding Bird Atlas and the Nocturnal Owl Survey uh, are conducted on the ancestral homelands of the Beothic people, whose people have been erased forever. And the island of Newfoundland is the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq people. And these people have been protecting and stewarding the land here since time immemorial. So through our work with the Breeding Bird Atlas and the Nocturnal Owl Survey, we hope to contribute to the stewardship and the effort, ship, and the effort to protect all the species we share this island with. And then just before we go any farther, I would also like to acknowledge the sponsors uh, and partners that, that help us to conduct both of these programs here in Newfoundland. And I would just like to single out the TD Friends of the Environment Foundation uh, because they have contributed substantially to the Nocturnal Owl Survey here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So this is the program for tonight. Uh, I'm gonna start by talking just a little bit about owls in general. And then we're gonna go through the six species of owls that we can find breeding here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, so five of those are breeding are breeders here in Newfoundland and one of them only breeds in Labrador, but we do see them in Newfoundland in the winter. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Nocturnal Owl Survey and how you can participate if you're interested. And then I'm going to talk about what we've learned from the Nocturnal Owl Survey. So what is some of the information that we've gotten out of this? Um, and I think that's a really important thing to highlight because although it's very cool and very fun to go out and do a Nocturnal Owl Survey, it's also incredibly useful. Um, and so this, this really does generate information that can be put to use for science, which I think is really cool. And we will end, as we often do end our webinars, with a quiz. Uh, so this one will be a sound quiz. And it's a lot of fun, obviously, no pressure, um, but it should be enjoyable. OK, so let's start by talking about owl diversity. Uh, there are only two families of owls. Uh, so that's the Strigidae, which is the true or typical owl family, and then the Titanidae, which is the barn owl family. So barn owls are a little bit different. Um, However, dis despite only having these two families, we see lots and lots of diversity. So there's more than 250 species worldwide. Uh, here in North America, we have 19 of those species, 16 of which are in Canada. Uh, and then obviously here in Newfoundland, we're talking about only six of them. Um, none of these owls are actually the species that breed here in Newfoundland, uh, but they do kind of showcase the incredible diversity that you can see. Um, so you'll see a lot of diversity just in terms of head shape, facial disc, coloration. Uh, there's also tons of variation in terms of size. So the tiniest owl in the world is the elf owl, which is five to six inches tall and weighs about an ounce and a half. And then the largest North American owl, at least in appearance, is the great gray owl, uh, which is up to 32 inches tall and has a wingspan of 60 inches. So there's huge variation in size. Um, and I'm sure many of you also know that there's lots of variation in behavior. So for example, we think of owls as being typically nocturnal, uh, but they are not always nocturnal. We do have several diurnal owl species that we'll be talking about today. Um, and we think of them as hunting small mammals, but they can also hunt insects, they can hunt fish, um, they can hunt other owls. So there is a lot of variation. However, there are characteristics that all owls share. Um, and so that's what I wanted to talk about next. Uh, so one of the things we all think about when we think about owls are their really big eyes. Uh, so owl eyes can actually be up to 3% of their body weight. So if you have say a 1.5 kilogram bird, that's 45 gram eyes. Um, and just for comparison, eyes account for 0.0003 three percent of a human's body weight. So obviously owl eyes are pretty substantial and uh, relative to their size. Um, they are, uh, they have lots of rods. Um, so cones, if you remember back to high school science, cones are responsible for your color vision, but rods are responsible for vision at low light levels. So that helps them see at night. Um, they do have binocular vision, so unlike many birds, they don't have their eyes on the side of the head, they have them on the front of the head, which means that um, the eyes face forward like ours, and that helps them have binocular vision and depth perception. Um, so it doesn't mean that they are, uh, it, it means that they're not as good at detecting predators um, as, as some other birds are with the eyes positioned on either side of the head, uh, but that's not a big worry for many owls. Uh, so yeah, they can they can see in front of them, they have great depth perception. And they have these long tube-shaped eyes. 
Uh, and you can see in the, um, in the diagram of the skull there. And these tube-shaped eyes are held in place by bony structures, which are called sclerotic rings. And what that means is that owls can't move their eyes from side to side the way we can. So the eyes only look straight ahead. They don't move more than one degree. Uh, and because they can't look from side to side like we can, uh, they actually have to move their entire heads to get a good look around, which is where that characteristic uh, bobbing and weaving of, of owl necks and uh, twisting of their heads comes from. Uh, so they can actually turn their heads up to about 270 degrees in either direction without moving their shoulders, which is pretty incredible and certainly beats us. Um, so owls are known for their vision. They are also known for their hearing. Uh, so they have very good hearing and the ability to pinpoint prey under snow or leaves. And that's partly because of their round facial disc. So when you look at an owl's face, you see that line of feathers around the edge. And that acts as a parabolic dish, which focuses the sound towards the ears. Um, they do hear in both ears, like humans, and the ears are, in most species anyway, asymmetrically placed, uh, usually with the left ear positioned lower than the right. Um, and this generates just a tiny bit of separation between when a sound hits one ear and when a sound hits the other ear, and that allows the owl to better pinpoint the source of the sound. Um, so we, with our symmetrically placed ears, can't do that. Uh, another characteristic, oops, sorry, asymmetrical ears. Um, another characteristic that people tend to think of when they think about owls is how silent they are. So I think part of the magic of owls is uh, if you're standing in a forest or in a clearing and you look up and you see an owl soaring over you, but you don't hear it at all. Uh, they are incredibly silent hunters and they have feathers especially structured for silent flight. Um, so when most birds fly, the air turbulence that's created by the wing flapping produces a sound. And typically the larger a bird is, the noisier its flight. Uh, but this is not the case with owls, which are, at least in some cases, quite large birds. Um, so the structure of their feathers serves as a silencer. They have these comb-like serrations on the leading edge of their wing feathers, which break up the turbulent air that typically creates a swooshing sound when they fly. Uh, and then they've also got a velvety texture that's unique to owl feathers that further dampens uh, these small streams of air. So first the serrations break it up and then it's further dampened by the, the velvety texture of the owl's feathers. And then a soft fringe on the wind, wing's trailing edge, which is what you can see in this picture here. Uh, and so with all of these structures together, they streamline the airflow and they absorb the sound that's produced. Uh, and then to top it all off, owls tend to have very large wings, which enable them to fly slowly and do a lot of gliding. Um, so they are very, very silent hunters. And obviously, uh, this, this, these structures didn't evolve by chance. So silent flight is clearly crucial for many owl survival. And there are sort of two long held hypotheses that attempt to explain why it's so important for them to be silent. So there's the stealthy hunting hypothesis. Uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. Owls need to fly inaudibly so that their prey can't hear them coming and therefore the prey have less time to escape. On the other hand, uh, you can also consider that if you're making a lot of noise while you fly, uh, you actually won't be able to hear your prey. So never mind your prey hearing you coming, you won't be able to hear them. So this is called the prey detection hypothesis. And that uh, poses that silent flight helps owls in hearing and tracking prey. Um, so these are obviously not mutually exclusive hy hypotheses, uh, but clearly there are evolutionary reasons why it's very important for owls to fly silently. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about owls in general, we're going to get a bit more specific and we are going to talk about the species of owls that we have here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, so I have five species in the picture there. You'll probably remember I said six. These are the five that we actually have on the island of Newfoundland and we will get to the sixth. You can probably guess what it might be. So the first owl species I wanna talk about is our biggest breeding owl. Um, and you know, in my notes here from a few years ago, I have that it's the most common breeding owl species in Newfoundland and Labrador. The interesting thing is based on our nocturnal owl survey data, I'm not sure this is the case anymore. So I'm, I'm gonna put a little caveat with that. Um, but these guys are sort of your stereotypical owl. It's often what people think of when they think of owls. Uh, great horned owls are strictly nocturnal. 
So they roost in trees, they often hunt along forest edges uh, and meadows and in the open country, and they are very impressive predators. Uh, so they are capable of killing hares, uh, they're also capable of killing porcupines and raptors, other owls. So these guys are substantial owls. And uh, if you should happen to come across a great horned owl nest while you are out uh, for a walk or a hike, uh, you should back away very quickly because they are quite formidable. Uh, so the keys, the identifying keys for a great horned owl, the big one is the ear tufts. Um, here in Newfoundland, there's really not too much you can mistake for it. Uh, they are by far our largest owl. They're pretty stocky. And then they have those big ear tufts, which are not actually ears. They are display feathers. Um, they have enormous eyes, which are bright yellow, although you can't really see them on this guy who's looking pretty grumpy. Um, they have a white throat, which you can just see. This guy seems to have sort of tucked his chin in, but you can see that white line of the throat there. And then you've got barred chest and belly, so those horizontal stripes. And then the back, which you can't see on this guy, is kind of mottled. Uh, it's a mottled grayish color. So these guys, I've got three sounds here for them. The first is their song, uh, and it's a very stereotypical owl song. So it's basically a deep hooting, um, and people will often, as a mnemonic, say that the owl says, who's awake? Me too. So I'll play that one for you. Oops, no, apparently I won't. Uh, here we go. So I'll do that again. So that's the who's awake, me too. And for great horned owls, you actually often find that the males and females will sing duets of alternating cause, calls. So you'll hear two owls singing and it's very clearly two owls singing because the female's uh, voice is higher in pitch than the male. So you can actually tell the difference. <laughs> And of course, if they both sing at the same time, that also helps a lot with telling the, that there are two owls there. Uh, last year, I was fortunate enough to actually hear that on an owl survey we did. So we did actually hear great horned owls singing to each other. And then the final sound that you might want to, that you can associate with these guys is a scream that they make when they're defending the nest. So I'll play that for you as well. <laughs> Uh, to me, that noise sounds a little bit like a duck being squeezed, or what I imagine a duck being squeezed might sound like. Um, so it doesn't sound all that formidable, but again, if you see a great horned owl nest, back away. Uh, they are very, very aggressive defenders of their nest. Uh, our next owl, so we're going from our largest owl to our smallest owl, which is the northern sawwet owl. And these guys are actually a relatively recent arrival to Newfoundland. Uh, with the first breeding record for northern sawwood owls on the island dating from 2017. Uh, but they've become increasingly common over the past few years. Uh, and last year we actually had them breeding in the St. John's Botanical Gardens. Um, and I think they, based on recent um, breeding or recent nocturnal owl survey data, they may actually be our most common owl now. Um, so these guys are pretty flexible in terms of habitat. They, they like a variety of forests. Um, they, they seem to actually like areas with different forest ages occurring together, uh, and they like an open understory for foraging. Uh, like the great horned owl, these guys are strictly nocturnal, so they roost during the day, and they are cavity nesters, so they nest in holes made by woodpeckers. Um, they don't excavate their own holes, but they use uh, holes created by other species, and they will also use nest boxes. So that record from 2017 was a sawwet owl nesting in a nest box. Um, so identifying cues for sawwet owls. Um, you'll see around the facial disc, there is no black border. So you see the sort of, it, it almost blends in with the, uh, with the rest of the head. And you'll see that on the forehead there, he's got some nice stripes. Uh, between the eyes, you've got a white V, um, which is really obvious. Uh, you, um, and then the breast and the belly have broad brown streaks. And then the back is brown uh, with some white braces, which you can kind of see along the edge of the wing there. So northern sawwood owls 
uh, they make a very, very easily recognized call. Basically, it's an insistent series of whistled notes at about the same pitch. So a monotonous beep, 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 given at roughly two notes per second, but it does vary a lot. Uh, so to me, they sound a little bit like radar or a tiny truck backing up in the forest. Um, and this is where the owl got its name because people thought that the song sounded a lot like a blade being sharpened on a whetstone. Um, and I'll just add a story from last year when I was doing the, the uh, nocturnal owl survey. It does involve using playback, and one of our playbacks is a sawwood owl playback. So I was standing um, right near the edge of a housing development in St. John's, just uh, yeah, just outside of St. John's, and I was standing right at the edge of the road, and we were playing sawwood owl uh, calls out to the forest. And two people came rushing out of their house, walked right up to us, and said are you doing this in our backyard at one o'clock in the morning? And I said, excuse me? He said, this noise, we hear it insistently in our backyard at one o'clock in the morning. Are you out there doing this? And so I had to explain to him that no, that was an actual owl that was in his backyard. Um, so these guys, a lot of people will notice because they, they can get, they, they can be a lot. Their sound is pretty persistent. Uh, and I'll play the song for you now. So you can see how at one o'clock in the morning, if you're trying to go to bed, that could be a little bit frustrating. Um, it's just that very insistent repeated note. Uh, the next owl I wanna talk about is the boreal owl, which is our other small nocturnal owl. Um, these guys do occupy a similar niche to the sawwet owls. So they also breed in tree cavities. They also consume a diet of small mammals, birds and insects. Uh, but they, they do favor boreal forests, so not as much the mixed forest like the Sawet. Um, and with these guys, uh, one neat fact is that female boreal owls are actually much larger than male boreal owls, and they actually show the most extreme difference in sexes of any North American owl, so the female can actually be twice as heavy as the male. So identifying cues for the boreal owl. Um, so like the Sawet, you've got a large head, you've got yellow eyes, quite a small body. Uh, the main cue I use, uh, which actually isn't one a lot of people necessarily pick out, but I compare the bill color. So you can see that the bill on the boreal owl is that very light ivory, grayish ivory kind of color. Whereas if we go back to the sawit, you can see that the bill is dark. Um, so that's the, the cue that I use, but there are also uh, many other cues. So you'll see that there's a spotted forehead in contrast to the sawit owl striped forehead. Uh, and there is a frame around the, the facial disc, but instead of, um, instead of being like a complete black frame, you'll see that it's sort of broken with these white spots. Um, on the belly, it has brown and white spots and streaks, and it has white spots on the back. So instead of those braces on the saltwood owl, you see white spots everywhere. Um, and then it's hard to find a picture where the tail is completely visible. It's quite difficult to find nice photos of boreal owls. Uh, but there are three horizontal rows of white dots on the tail, and you can see the bottom row there and some of the second row. Um, so that is also diagnostic. Boreal owl calls uh, are basically, they're again, a series of low whistled toots, but they get progressively louder, unlike the Sawit song. So they're not as monotonous. Um, so I will play that for you now. Uh, they are a pretty unique sound. However, there is one thing that they do resemble quite closely, and that is the display flight of the Wilson snipe. Uh, so Wilson snipe make a sound very much like that when they dive uh, as, as a display to potential mates. And the thing that makes the sound is they're not actually making that uh, with, their, uh, with their vocal cords, they're actually making it uh, through the wind passing over modified outer tail feathers. Um, so one of the ways that uh, you can tell the difference between a boreal owl song and a Wilson snipe display is by figuring out if the sound is moving. So boreal owls will sit in one location and sing, whereas Wilson snipe have to move to make that sound. 
Um, it can be quite difficult to tell the difference, especially if the owl or the snipe is far away. Uh, but I will say that snipe are much, much, much more common than boreal owl. Um, so as part of the nocturnal owl survey, we ask people to fill out a special form when they uh, detect boreal owls because they are quite unusual. Um, male boreal owls will sing until they find a mate or until that female starts nesting, but then they pretty much stop singing after that. So I'll play that song once more. Okay, so we are now finished with our three nocturnal owls, and we will move on to some of our diurnal owls. Oops, apparently we're going to jump right into the, uh, the identification. So northern hawk owls, these are quite unusual owls. I have not had the fortune to see one here in Newfoundland yet, but I'm hoping to. Um, so these guys are fully diurnal. They hunt during the day. They use sight primarily to detect their prey. Uh, they do have keen hearing, so they can, for example, detect prey under a layer of snow. Uh, but they, they have um, sort of a long tail and a flight pattern, which is a mix of slow wing beats and then very long glides that makes them really quite closely resemble hawks, which is where they got their name. Um, these guys like tundra, but they also like boreal forests near openings such as bogs, burns, or, or cut blocks. They do not like cities and towns, so we're not likely to find one of these nesting in the St. John's Botanical Gardens. So identifying cues for the northern hawk owl. Uh, you have a spotted forehead, like the boreal owl, but the crown is also spotted. You've got a quite severe black frame around the facial disc. Uh, again, we have yellow eyes, but in the northern hawk owl, the bill is yellow, not ivory like the boreal owl and not dark like the solid owl. Uh, the, the back is brown with white spots and you've got barred underparts, but in contrast to the vertical streaks on the solid and the boreal, you've got horizontal bars on the hawk owl. And then you've got that very long characteristic tail. Um, so I will also play the sound. Uh, hawk owls, because you often see them during the day, then you're less likely to need to identify them by sound. But they do sing a rolling whistled song that lasts around 14 seconds. And they do this while performing uh, display flights if they're uh, for the males. So this is what it sounds like. Kind of a funny sound. I'll play it again. So the males sing that while they're performing display flights and the females sing something quite similar, but it's a little bit shorter and hoarser. Um, I find this song really hard to characterize, but I sometimes think about, uh, it's, it's almost reminds me a little bit of an amphibian noise. Um, how you remember bird song is a really personal thing, but I often like to just say what I hear because as I say, it can be quite tricky to do. So yeah, this one sounds a little bit like a frog call to me. Um, so just to go back over the, the three um, owl species that we just talked about, uh, you can, there, there are a few key differences that I wanna point out. So on the sawwit owl, uh, remember we've got a, a frame that blends into the rest of its head. On the boreal owl, we've got a dark frame, but it's broken by those white dots. And on the hawk owl, we have a bold black frame around the facial disc. Uh, the sawwit has a striped forehead, the boreal owl has a spotted forehead, and the hawk owl has a spotted forehead, but also a spotted crown. And then, as I said, we've got vertical stripes on the boreal owl um, and the sawwit owl. The boreal owl also has some spots. And then you see horizontal barring on the hawk owl. And you can see the really obvious difference in the tail length there as well. Uh, so the hawk owl has a very long tail. Uh, the other thing is, if it's active during the day, it's a hawk owl, uh, because boreal owls and sawwit owls are nocturnal. Okay, so just a couple species of owls left. Um, I love these guys. They are among my favorites. The short-eared owl, also known as the grass owl, they are open habitat specialists. So they really like open country, like our barrens and bogs uh, and some of the, yeah, some of the tundra areas. Uh, they, these guys are really good at hovering while they hunt and they forage both by day and night. Um, so they're not nocturnal owls. They're what we call crepuscular, which I still maintain is one of the worst words the English language has to offer, uh, but they are most active at dawn and dusk. 
Uh, they like to cruise low over open habitats looking for small mammals, and they are actually ground nesters. Uh, so you can see where these guys get their names. They've got those little short ear tufts. Uh, those are not always obvious, so it can be quite difficult. Uh, so for example, you can see on the flying owl there, uh, you can't really see those little ear tufts. So that's not the best diagnostic cue. Um, they have a pale facial disc. They've got yellow eyes with black rims. Uh, and Jenna likes to say that they look like they are wearing 90s grunge eye makeup. And so that is one of the ID cues that I remember best now. They, they do, they look like they stumbled out of bed and they forgot to take off last night's makeup. Um, they are buffy overall with dark streaking and barring. Uh, the females are darker than the males. And uh, if you look at the difference between the breast and the belly here, you'll see that the, the chest is more buff with more streaking and the belly tends to be whiter with less streaking. Um, and the, the streaking and the coloration of the owl is a little bit like dried, uh, dried grass and helps a lot for camouflage. Um, you most often see short-eared owls in flight. Uh, that's when you're most likely to, to detect them. And so one of the things you wanna look at is those dark bars on the underwing. Um, so you see it's, it's almost got wrist bars there. It's got long broad wings with dark tips, but then those dark bars. Uh, and the flight, it's been described as a bit moth-like, uh, so a little bit floppy. Uh, short-eared owls really aren't particularly vocal but they do have a primary song, which is a series of a dozen or more hoots. And it's given by males during courtship flight and sometimes from the ground or from an elevated perch. So I will play that, remembering that you're more likely to see than hear a short-eared owl. <laughs> so for this one, I think a little bit of a monkey. <laughs> Uh, and then both males and females can bark or scream uh, when they're defending the nest and the offspring. Uh, and I will say that short-eared owls are one of our uh, listed species at risk here in the province. Short-eared owls can sometimes be mistaken for northern harriers and vice versa. Um, they are found in similar habitats, so that open habitat, uh, and they hunt in a similar fashion. Um, so they tend to fly low over the ground looking for small mammals. So a couple of ID cues that you can use to make sure that you are seeing a short-eared owl or versus a northern harrier. Um, so the big thing I use with northern harriers, uh, as those of you who attended Jenna's webinar on the raptors will remember, northern harriers have a white rump. Uh, both the males and the females here, you can see very clearly, have that white rump. Um, and so that is really very diagnostic for northern harriers. Uh, they also have a longer tail than the short-eared owl, as you can see. And um, the northern harrier has a dark wingtip like the short-eared owl, but they don't have those two dark wing bars. Uh, so the primary things you want to focus on are the rump, the tail, and the underside of the wing when you're trying to distinguish between the two. Okay, and our final species of owl uh, here in Newfoundland and Labrador is the snowy owl. Um, this owl is the largest by weight of the North American owls, and it shows up irregularly in Newfoundland during the winter to hunt uh, in our sort of open areas. Uh, and this happens particularly when lemmings are scarce in the species typical wintering areas, which, is, which are actually further north. When it comes to breeding season, the only place in the province you'll likely see snowy owls is the northern reaches of Labrador. Uh, they actually spend their winters, or their winters, their summers, north of the Arctic Circle hunting lemmings and ptarmigan. Uh, and obviously they are diurnal because if they weren't diurnal, they would be waiting for quite a while uh, for the sun to go down in the Arctic summer. Uh, they are fierce protectors of their nests and they will actually attack predators as large as humans and wolves. Um, I didn't put any field marks on this guy because quite honestly, what am I gonna say? Big white owl. Um, so the adult male is a large white owl with piercing yellow eyes. Um, males range from pure white to white with a few brown spots, but females and immatures are white with darker barring, uh, except on the face. Face of a snowy owl is always pure white. So you can see there, you've got some dark barring. Um, again, there really isn't much you can uh, mistake a snowy owl for. 
Um, both sexes, uh, but especially male snowy owls, uh, make low, powerful, slightly rasping hoots. Um, they're, they're given sort of two at a time, sometimes one at a time, can be up to six in a row. Uh, they're very low and they travel really well over open country like the tundra where these guys breed. Uh, so they can actually be heard for up to seven miles over the over the tundra and other owls will often answer with hoots of their own. So I will play the snowy owl. Ooh. So you can see much slower and more powerful hoots uh, than the short-eared owl. Ooh. Okay. All right, so those are our six species here in Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, before I want go into the nocturnal owl survey, which is what we're gonna focus on now, just wanted to touch briefly on the relationship between owls and people, because people are fascinated by owls. I fully admit to being one of those people fascinated by owls. Uh, they're important in the mythology of several ancient cultures. So for example, in Greece, owls were the symbol of the goddess of wisdom, Athena, uh, and they were considered a protector. So they would accompany Greek armies to war. Uh, and if, if an owl flew over Greek soldiers before battle, they thought it was a sign of victory. Uh, however, the ancient Romans completely disagreed with them because they considered owls to be a symbol of death. And if you heard an owl's ho hoot, it meant you were not long for this world. Um, and for example, the deaths of Julius Caesar and Augustus were supposedly predicted by an owl. And for that reason, owls were also believed to predict failure on the field of battle. Uh, so Romans also believed that witches could transform themselves into owls and then suck the blood of babies. So they really were not big fans of owls. Um, and you know, if you look at English literature, you also see that barn owls have sinister reputation. Um, likely because they are birds of darkness. So owls are often associated with night and with darkness and with death. Um, and so uh, poets Robert Blair and William Wordsworth actually use the barn owl as their favorite bird of doom. Um, before I go any further, I should also probably explain this photo. It's not very often you get an actual owl sitting on an owl shower, shower curtain. Uh, I happen to be staying with a friend in BC who was responsible for the reintroduction of burrowing owls into the Okanagan Valley. And as part of this program, she had an education owl named Pilot. Uh, and Pilot lived outside in a little enclosure, but sometimes if he had two school programs in a row, uh, she would keep him in her bathroom overnight rather than releasing him and then having to catch him the next morning. Uh, so every once in a while when I was staying with her, I would be having a shower with an owl watching me from the shower curtain. Uh, it was it was a surprisingly entertaining experience. Of course, when you talk about the relationship between any uh, wildlife and people, you always have to talk about threats. Um, and a lot of the the threats to owls are are things that we are causing. Um, so a major cause of population decline is the loss or fragmentation, that is the breaking up of the forest habitat on which many species depend. Uh, so for example, the northern spotted owl population in BC uh, has it depends heavily on the old growth forest there. And by the, the logging of the old growth forest has completely devastated the population and the species is now listed as endangered. Um, climate change is obviously a risk to owls and uh, we're seeing a lot of shifts in owl ranges with climate change. Uh, vehicle strikes can also be a major issue for owls. And I've had a number of people report hitting sawwet owls here in Newfoundland with their vehicles uh, and then poisoning. Um, so for example, if you poison small mammal populations that can carry on up the food chain. I should add that besides being important in and of themselves, and as I said, a source of fascination, uh, owls are top predators. So as top predators, they're also really excellent indicators of environmental health. Uh, so the health of the owl population can tell us a lot about the health of the ecosystem. However, we often don't know that much about owl populations, uh, and that's because they tend to be rather secretive and many of them are nocturnal. And so they don't tend to be terribly well monitored by many of the typical surveys we use to monitor bird populations. Uh, so for example, a really characteristic survey is called the Breeding Bird Survey, which is done early in the morning in the month of June and uh, is very unlikely to pick up any of our nocturnal owls. 
Um, so thus, we really need to find specific surveys uh, and carry those out to learn more about and monitor the, the distribution and the abundance of owl populations. And obviously, that is where the nocturnal owl survey comes in. So this is a major citizen science program, and it's run across Canada every year. Uh, so we have volunteers in every Canadian province that participate. Uh, so here in the um, here in Newfoundland, we are part of the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey, uh, which takes place between the 1st of April and the 15th of May every year. And it involves citizen scientists listening for owls along a predetermined route. So each route has 10 stops, um, about two kilometers apart, and the uh, surveyors stop at each stop, listen for two minutes, and then use owl playback uh, and basically listen and tell us what they've heard. Uh, it is a fantastic program for anyone. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you like being out at, out at night, if you like hot chocolate, if you like seeing the world in a slightly different way, it's a great survey. But as I said, it's also really good for beginning birders uh, because really you only need to know those three species of nocturnal owls that I mentioned. So you need to know the great horns, you need to know the sawwed, and you need to know the boreal owl. Um, so this survey in the Maritimes has been going on for more than 20 years. Uh, and some of those routes, so each of those little markers is a route. The red ones are routes that uh, ha had been adopted by somebody at the time that the screenshot was taken. The green ones are open routes. Um, some people have surveyed the same route for 20 years. Uh, so I should also note that the Maritimes have some owl species we don't get here. So the photos in this picture uh, include the, the barred owl in the top photo, the eastern screech owl in the middle photo, and the long-eared owl, which basically we don't, none of those we get here in Newfoundland. So the Newfoundland part of the Nocturnal Owl Survey. We have not been doing our survey for the past 20 years. As I said, this was launched in 2018. Uh, and in 2019, when I took it over, we had 35 routes, 33 of which were in Newfoundland, two of which were in Labrador, and we had 13 volunteers. Uh, so you can probably guess we did not get all 35 routes surveyed. Uh, we only had data submitted from 14 of those routes. And so one of our major focuses here in Newfoundland and Labrador has been to expand our nocturnal owl survey. Uh, so we have gone over the past few years from those initial 35 routes to 68 routes in 2022. Um, and uh, we still don't have too many in Labrador. We currently have four, uh, but we're, we're hoping to continue to expand there. And one of the big pluses you can see is we have managed to expand our spatial coverage a little bit. So those are the initial 35 routes. Um, unfortunately, as a citizen science survey, we are limited to surveying where there are people. Uh, so you can see the concentration of routes around Corner Brook and around St. John's. And then there are some in Terra Nova National Park um, because the grad student who started the survey was teeing a class there and could take his students out. Uh, however, over the past few years, uh, that was the um, 2021 20, and that was 2022, you can see that we are starting to spread and we are starting to increase our coverage. Obviously, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we are still looking particularly for uh, in anything on the Northern Peninsula. We need to increase our coverage there and uh, the Bay Vert Peninsula and then South Central Newfoundland where there aren't a lot of roads. So that does make things pretty difficult. Uh, so if anybody on the, who's attending this presentation happens to live in any of those places and would like to do an owl route, please talk to me. How do you participate in the Nocturnal Owl Survey? Uh, so the first thing you have to do is register for the survey on our Nature Counts platform. And perhaps Jenna could put the link for the Nature Counts uh, Nocturnal Owl Survey into the chat. Um, once you're in there, you can find and adopt a free route. So you go to data uh, and then one of the options is available routes and the available routes will show up as um, green. So you can take one of those on. Uh, you then train to be and be prepared. So there are uh, training materials. There's a protocol manual on the, the website. Uh, and I will also be doing several Q&A sessions next week. And after that, you choose any one evening between the 1st of April and the 15th of May to do your survey. Uh, so what you want to be careful of there is you want to make sure to pick a, an evening with good weather, uh, which can be a challenge here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, so you don't want it to be too cold. Uh, you don't want it to be persistently snowing or raining. And very importantly, it can't be too windy. 
Uh, so our cutoff is Beaufort level three, which translates to 20 kilometers per hour. Uh, it can be quite difficult to find an evening in Newfoundland where the wind is below 20 kilometers an hour. Uh, and then once you've done the survey, you can enter the data yourself or you can send it to us to enter. So this is an example of a survey route, um, and this is how it actually works. So when you adopt a route, uh, you start by having a look at the route description, and uh, that, that will include the coordinates for each of the 10 stops. Uh, you can pro program those coordinates into a GPS or a phone, or you can contact me and I will share a Google map of the route with you. Um, and then many of these packages also include descriptions of the stops, but not all of them do. Uh, you can start at either end of the route, uh, so you could start from the gray dot there or you could start from the red dot there, but it is important to do the entire route in one night, uh, so we can't split the route between nights. Um, it's a good idea to check out the route ahead of time in the daylight, uh, because, but on the day of the survey you're going to start half an hour after sunset, and doing a complete route usually takes about 2.5 to 3 hours. Um, at each stop, you'll pull the car over, get out, and use a portable speaker to play back a special broadcast track. So on our website, we have a training track available, which lets you practice the sounds, uh, but we also have a broadcast track. And this track alternates silent listening periods, which I've shown in blue there, uh, with playback of boreal owl and sawwood owl calls. And we use this playback to increase our ability to detect owls. Uh, but this is also the reason that we ask you to do the survey on one night only. Uh, playback makes owls think that there is another owl in the area, which could be viewed as competition for territory or sometimes as a potential predator uh, with great horned owl calls, although we don't use those in our playback. And although we use playback briefly, uh, it does cause some stress to the owls. And that's why we say only do your survey one night a year. Um, so you can see here, we start the survey with two minutes of silence, and then we have two periods of boreal owl calls followed by a minute of silence, and two periods of solid owl calls followed by a minute of silence. So I just kind of want to take you through the data entry because it does get a little complicated. So we're interested not only in how many owls you hear, but also exactly when you hear them during the survey, uh, because that allows us to do more with the data, like examine how species respond to playback. So if we go through this example, let's say you're doing a survey, you go through your first minute of the survey and you hear nothing at all. But during the second minute of the survey, you hear a great horned owl hooting. So there's our great horned owl. So on your data sheet, this is what that would translate to. You write the species, which is great horned owl, G-H-O-W, and you put an X for the second minute. So you didn't hear him in the first minute, you did hear him in the second minute, but you didn't see him. So you put an X there because that just means heard. Then let's say in the next minute of the survey, so you hear play your boreal owl calls, and then after that, uh, this great horned owl, which was initially singing, continues to sing, but now actually approaches. So you see it, uh, and lets you confirm the species. You also get a response from a northern sawwood owl. So on your data sheet, what you would do is you would keep filling in the line for your first great horned owl, because this is the same individual, you would put another X because you heard it in this minute after Boreal Owl, but you would also put an S because you saw it. For the Sawwood Owl, you would just put an X because you heard it. So new individual, new line. Then let's say after the second Boreal Owl playback, you don't hear the Great Horned Owl anymore, but now you hear two Sawwets. So you hear the first Sawwet, the same bird as before, plus a second. You would then put another X for this first Sawwet Owl, because you heard it again after the second boreal owl. And then there's a second individual, so you would add another line. You use a separate line for each individual owl, even if it is the same species. And then after the first saw what owl playback, you have silence again. So you would just leave that blank on your sheet. And then after the second boreal, uh, second boreal owl playback, you hear two great horned owls. Uh, sorry, I'm saying boreal owl playback, but I mean uh, sawwood owl playback. So you hear two great horned owls based on where they are. You think one is the same individual as you heard in the first bit part of the survey, but you think one is, uh, you know that one is a, a, an additional individual. So what you would do then is add another line for that other individual. And uh, your first individual, you would put another X after the northern saw, or after the second northern sawwood owl playback. 
and then you would add an X for this in additional individual. The repeat column, the last column there, is for owls that you think are the same owl you heard at the last stop. So for the first stop, obviously none of the owls are repeats, but afterwards you can write yes in this column. Um, if, for example, you were doing a stop and you heard an owl directly to the south, and then you continued that way, and at your next stop you heard an owl directly to the north, that suggests it might be the same individual between stops. So you have to use your best judgment on that one. Um, I should add that this would be a pretty extraordinary owl survey if you got all of that at one stop. That hasn't been my experience. Uh, it's not super likely to happen, but even when you only get one individual from the whole survey, it's definitely still worth doing. It's a lot of fun. Uh, there are a number, number of other things you do record. Uh, so you record your start time, you record information about the weather, the noise level, and you count the number of passing cars. Um, and you also calculate the, a rough estimate of the distance and direction to each owl. And all of that is on the data sheet that we provide. So I'm going to leave it at that for how you do the nocturnal owl survey. And I'm just going to finish up here with a little bit of a discussion of why we do the nocturnal owl survey and what kind of things we are able to figure out from it. One of the things that I think is the coolest about the nocturnal owl survey is that it is a Canada-wide survey. And although we have different species of owls across Canada, um, we all start with that two-minute silent listening period at the beginning. So it's standard across the country, and that actually allows us to compare results from different surveys across the country. Um, so the first thing that the Nocturnal Owl Survey allows us to do is keep track of owl population trends over time. Uh, and so the data that I'm going to show you here is actually derived from the Nocturnal Owl Survey data collected by the volunteers in the three maritime provinces, uh, which have just hit their 20 year anniversary of the Nocturnal Owl Survey. And so these graphs show you global trends uh, over 20 years in each province uh, for the three main species of owls in the Maritimes. So the first is the barred owl. And you can see in all three provinces, you've got an overall positive trend. Uh, the second is the great horned owl. And you see overall, again, in all three provinces, a negative trend. And then for the sawwood owl or northern sawwood owl, you've got relatively stable trends except in PEI. Uh, but you also see cyclic abundance. So you can see that the population goes up and down. Uh, so there are these two year cycles and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, so obviously it's useful for uh, the nocturnal owl survey allows us to track populations. It's also really useful for looking at movement and population cycles and being combined with other forms of data. So Northern sawwood owls are eruptive migrants, which means that they exploit food sources that vary a lot in distribution from year to year. So they, they eat things like mice and voles. Uh, and sometimes you have explosions of mice populations or vole populations, and sometimes you have very low populations. Uh, and so sawwood owls are very flexible in their movements because they need to be able to exploit these sources. And what that means is there's a high variability in the number of individuals that are encountered in fall migration each year, because based on prey availability, you see fluctuations in numbers. Um, and so there's a team at the Université de Saint-Anne, uh, which uh, is led by Professor Sean Craig, and they've been monitoring the density of sawwets on fall migration through their campus at Church Point in Nova Scotia, which is the red star there. Um, and so they, they've been monitoring this over a long period of time, from 2012 to 2020 at the time the study was published, but they've continued to monitor them, and they've banded 220 sawwets. And uh, this graph here, um, so what they found is the population cycles over two years, which we already saw in the population graph um, for, for the sawwood owl for the maritime provinces. So every two years, they catch a high density of migrants. But actually, that isn't what this graph shows. This graph actually shows the ratio of hatchier birds, so birds that hatched that summer, to adult birds. Um, and so in the years where they catch a lot of birds, they also find that they catch um, a lot of immature owls. So immature owls are at least twice as abundant as the adults. Uh, so in 2020, immature birds were actually 21 times more abundant um, than adult birds. Uh, but that's not the case in the years with fewer migrants. And so this high ratio of hatch year to adult birds suggests that one of the reasons we might see eruptions of sawwets um, is that high prey availability actually increases the breeding density of the adults and therefore they produce more young. Uh, and so to investigate whether this might be the case, Dr. Craig's team actually used data from the Nocturnal Owl Survey and found that in the years where they, they have had this really high ratio of hatchier birds to adults, 
They also found, or many more sawwood owls were detected on the nocturnal owl surveys. Uh, so it's very cool use of the data and they're working on publishing that. Nocturnal owl survey is also really important um, in terms of figuring out land management strategies and how we best manage land for owls. Uh, and because, um, because they are indicators of environmental health, they're at the top of the food chain, we can actually, by tracking their populations, we can get an idea of the health of the ecosystem. Um, so this graph is for the barred owl, uh, and it is one of the species that has rather specialized habitat requirements. So it depends on cavities and large trees for nesting, and the presence of a barred, of barred owls reflects the health of more mature older forests. Uh, so they're often a good indicator of sustainable forest management. Um, and so in New Brunswick, owl survey data um, also keeps track of whether owls are detected on public or private land. And that's what's being compared in this graph here. And uh, so you can see uh, the public land there, which is the purple line, actually seems to, we're seeing much less increase of barred owls on public land than we are on privately managed land, which is the orange uh, graph there. So that suggests that, um, something is going on. We were actually quite surprised by this graph, but it suggests that maybe prior forest management decisions can, may have influenced their populations. So for example, uh, some private owners may have left large blocks of forest um, that, that have been mature enough to contribute to population increase of barred owls. Uh, but on crown lands, forest management practices limit the amount and quality of older stands. And so that may not be as good uh, for barred owls in the long term. Uh, so this was a really interesting result, and in the future, hopefully we can start to get at what it is about the difference between private and public land that really works for barred owls uh, on private land. Um, and barred owls are often called an umbrella species because the protection of their habitat, which is that mature old growth forest, uh, often provides benefit for many other species that depend on old growth forest. And we're just about done here, but uh, something else we can do with the nocturnal owl survey data is start to look at uh, the associations between owls and habitat. Um, so this is an example shown in PEI, uh, which was once mostly forested, um, but now nearly half of the island has been cleared for agricultural use. And much of the forest that is currently present is young, uh, so it's, it's regrowing after being harvested in the past. Uh, and so a former Birds of Canada employee, Katie Stedholm, looked at owl survey data from 2010 to 2013, and then looked at the various types of habitats where each species was detected. So all of those black dots there are owl survey routes, and uh, she, the, you can see the different types of habitats that she was considering there. And so what she found is perhaps not a huge surprise, uh, but it's nice to be able to back up our assertions with actual data. So she found that barred owls preferred mixed hardwood conifer mature forest, as we said, they like these mature forest areas. They like larger and less isolated forest patches uh, and not so much residential developments. Great horned owls prefer mature softwood, so spruce or fir forest and open wetland areas. And northern sawwood owls are tolerant of younger forests and prefer larger, iso less isolated forest patches, which actually is a little bit of a surprise because we do see um, northern sawwood owls in botanical gardens in St. John's. Uh, and then finally, the other applications, perhaps the most important of these, at least in terms of Newfoundland, where we're in the midst of a um, breeding bird atlas, is putting rare species on the map. Um, it's very hard to analyze data for rare species, but it's important to protect habitats and sites used by these species from development. Um, and so we want to make sure that for our atlas, we pick up rare species like the boreal owl. Uh, and so the specialized protocol that we're using for the nocturnal owl surveys means that rare species like our boreal owls will be represented in our atlas and we'll be able to identify habitat areas that are important to them. Um, and we are also considering developing a similar survey for the short-eared owl. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we may be asking for more owl volunteers later in the summer. Uh, and I'm hoping that we don't actually have to wait 20 years to get some cool results out of our nocturnal owl survey, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, sawwets, which 
have only been breeding in this province that we know of since 2017, seem to be spreading extremely rapidly. Uh, so if you look at the range map for the Sawat owl, you can see I've circled Newfoundland there. We're not even considered part of their range. And historically, they have not been present on this island. Uh, however, they, they have been here for at least the last 10 years, and they seem to be moving progressively north. Uh, so last year, we had a Sawat owl detected on the northern peninsula. It was the furthest north Sawat owl yet detected in Newfoundland. Um, and so hopefully we will be in a position to track this range expansion of the Sawat owl. And at the same time, we're hearing from birders that there seems to be a decrease in the populations of boreal owls, uh, perhaps because there is some competitive interaction between the boreal owl and the Sawat owl. Um, and so we, we wanna be able to tell where our boreal owls as well, are as well and whether there's any interaction between these two owl species. So I'm hoping that's something we'll be able to do in the relatively near future with our nocturnal owl survey. So with that being said, we will move into the test your knowledge portion of the evening. I only have five questions and I apologize that I've gone a little bit over here. I get very excited about owls. Um, so we have some polls for you and these are all sound polls. So turn your sound way up and let's see if you remember these, these calls. So here's our first test call. Oops, apparently I can't do the poll and the sound at the same time. All right, sound first, poll after. Okay, so we'll launch that poll. Let's see if anybody remembers what he is. Okay, get your guesses in. Just a few more people. Okay, and any more guesses? All right, I'll end the poll now. Um, more than 90% of you got that right. That is indeed a great horned owl. Come on now, there we go. Uh, so that is our great horned owl, that very classic, who's awake? Me too. Um, Snowy owl and short-eared owl both give hoots, so you've got the right noise. Uh, snowy owls tend to give one or two um, low, powerful hoots. Short-eared owls, they make me think a little bit of a monkey, so kind of a monotonous series, a series of hoots, uh, but they don't have the same kind of who's awake, me too pattern. All right, so we'll go on to our next one. I'll play that again. All right, and we'll launch this poll. So see if you know who that guy is. This one seems to be a bit trickier. We're getting some more variety here. Okay, any, any last minute guesses? Okay, uh, end the poll now and share the results. Uh, so 48% of you said boreal owl uh, and that is the right answer here. Uh, it was a trickier question. Um, so some of you said Northern Sawat Owl. For Northern Sawat Owl, you are looking for that very monotonous beep, 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 like a small truck backing up. Uh, and then for Short-Eared Owl, again, that series of hoots, slower than that. And none of the above. That's an interesting question or an interesting guess. And perhaps we'll come back to that uh, in a couple slides. All right, so our next guy. And play that again. All right, we'll do the poll.
Okay, any more guesses? Last minute guesses? Okay, people seem done. Um, so again, a majority of you got this guy right. Uh, so this is our Northern Hawk Owl. This is the one that I think sounds a little bit like a frog call. And I heard it particularly in that recording. Uh, Sawet Owl would be slower toots and uh, less rolling. Um, and none of the above, uh, we'll come back to that one too. Oops, and I didn't actually share the results there. So now you can now you can see the results. Sorry about that. There's a lot of buttons to press here. Okay, we have just two more. We got this guy here. Okay, so guesses for this one. Any more guesses? Got over 80% participation, which is awesome. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. And this time I will share the results. Uh, so this was a really tricky one. Um, I think it's interesting that 13% of people said boreal owl and 30% of people said none of the above. None of the above is actually correct in this case. So that is that shorebird I was talking about, uh, the Wilson snipe. Um, so this is the sound that they make when air rushes over those modified outer tail feathers when they do their display flights. Uh, and I will play it for you again. Um, and you can kind of hear that it's not a bird singing. This is this recording is nice. You can actually kind of hear that it is that the the air moving here. Uh, so one of the things you can hear there is di differences in volume, uh, which are helpful because that suggests that the bird is moving, uh, which, as, as I said, is an indicator that it's a snipe and not a boreal owl because a boreal owl will sit in one place and sing. Okay, and our very last one here. So who do we have here? Okay, and I'm only going to play that once because it's long enough, I think. All right, we've got over 85% participation. Any final guesses here? All right, I'm going to end the poll. And great job. Um, more than almost 90% of you guessed that it was a solid owl. So that, again, that's that very monotonous uh, series of hoots. Um, so just sort of long, slow, slower than the shorter owl uh, and much higher and less powerful than the snowy owl. Uh, so the, the, the two very common species of nocturnal owls, so our great horned owl and our solid owl, you guys did very well on identifying. So great job. Um, I am really going to finish up here. Uh, the last thing that I was going to mention, and I will briefly say now, is pay attention to the body language of an owl. Um, when we're doing the nocturnal owl survey, and in general, we don't want to stress owls. Uh, so you can tell pretty easily when an owl is stressed, when they, I mean, owls almost always have wide eyes, but when they've got their eyes really, really uh, wide open, staring at you, preparing to fly, uh, when they're being defensive, um, so keep in mind that you should give owls space, you should move slowly and keep your voice low, don't feed them, 
avoid using playback except for the survey. And that is the reason that we actually do get a permit for this survey. Uh, and don't take flash photos when you're out doing nocturnal owl survey. Uh, owls don't, don't like a flash going off in their face any more than we do. So I will end there. Thank you for sticking with me for an extra 10 minutes. Uh, I have added the nocturnal owl survey website um, as well as the Atlas website. And you can email us at nlatlas at birdscanada.org. Please email me if you have any questions. If you're interested in the survey and can't find an open route, get in touch with me because things are pretty fluid right now and changing. And if you're interested in creating your own route, please get in touch with me as well. Uh, I'm always looking to expand our survey coverage. And I'll take any questions. Thanks, Catherine. There's been a few questions um, as we went along. And um, I left one, I didn't answer it because I thought you should talk about it again out loud. And it was um, whether us playing a broadcast of a call disrupts an owl's normal behavior. So um, does that mean that they would miss out on um, finding or keeping a mate if they're spending their time um, listening to a broadcast? Um, and I thought that's something that is worth mentioning again. So. It is something that's worth mentioning. So the short answer is yes, the use of playback does disturb an owl's normal behavior. Um, this is why we get a permit for this survey because it does constitute uh, disturbing wildlife. And this is why we only do the survey one evening for each route per year. So one volunteer, one evening per each route. Um, the survey is relatively short. So we're talking about seven minutes at each location. Uh, the maximum that you're going to get an owl hearing really is two locations. So we're talking about 14 minutes once a year. Um, it's not, it, it, it doesn't, basically, it's always a cost benefit trade off. Uh, so is the knowledge that we gain sufficient to disturb the owls to that extent? And because this is a small disturbance and we gain very valuable knowledge about owl populations, the answer is yes. Uh, but generally, you don't want to use playback to elicit a response from owls. Um, and certainly, if you were doing it repeatedly, it could absolutely take away from their time, say, mate guarding or eating. Uh, however, seven minutes shouldn't be enough to disturb them immensely. Thanks for that, Catherine. Um, and then another question I didn't get to in the chat is, do all owls sit and sing or do some sing while they're flying? That is a good question. Uh, I can't claim to be an expert on that, but most owls fly as silently as possible. So I would imagine that most of them don't don't make noise while they're flying. But Jenna, if you know otherwise, please step in there. Um, I'm also not a super owl expert, but you did mention for some of those ones that you were talking about that are doing um, a flight display. That or is true. Like yes. a, a mating song on the wing, then sometimes they're flying. Uh, Which actually tends to be the diurnal owls, which probably aren't as worried about being silent because they're going to be seen anyway. So yes, yes. Uh, it is true that um, in particular short-eared owls and hawk owls do actually do a display. Uh, so they sing on the wing. Our, our nocturnal owls are silent while moving. Yes. Um, and then I had a question that was, um, will the owl survey be continuing in Newfoundland and Labrador after the owls is over? Yes. It will be. It is a long-term survey. We are looking to follow in the footsteps of our maritime cousins and uh, hit our 20-year anniversary. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> um, and then also, are there any plans to do Northern Sawwet Owl Banding in Newfoundland and Labrador? Uh, so interestingly, the first detections of Northern Sawwet Owls in Newfoundland were because um, students at the College of the North Atlantic put up nest boxes, which were intended for boreal owls. Uh, but ended up uh, attracting sawwet owls. Uh, and they did do some banding. I myself uh, am not planning to ban sawwet owls. I would be interested to know if the government of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, had any plans to, but as far as I know right now, there are not plans. Um, okay, I have a question personally, because- Really, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And um, I was wondering, how a boreal owl could nest in a cavity when they're relying on a boreal forest in Newfoundland because the I, trees are so small. You know, I've had the same question. 
Uh, and I have even had that question with sawwood owls because we've detected sawwood owls in some places where I'm looking at the trees and I'm looking at the owl and I'm trying to picture how you, you know, stuff an owl into a, si a tree that size. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I suspect this is why we are finding many, many fewer boreal owls. I also wonder if that was part of the impetus behind uh, putting up nest boxes for boreal owls in case cavity availability was in fact a limiting factor. Um, however, since they didn't get any boreal owls in the cavity in the nest boxes, perhaps not. I mean, boreal <laughs> owls were recorded by uh, Peters and Burley when they did their survey of Newfoundland birds in the 50s, or I think late 30s, actually, late 30s, it was published in the 50s. So they've been here a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but they aren't super common. And that could be an issue of availability of sufficiently sized trees. Yeah, uh, interesting thing that... Uh... <laughs> right yeah they, they are substantially question. bigger than the saw wet owls so yeah um i did put a link in the chat earlier about if you were interested in building nest boxes um there's a site by the cornell lab of ornithology that has sort of dimensions for different species i'll put it there again if anyone missed it and is interested and yes um there's a question right now about if owls like nest boxes and um, some of them do, so the northern sawwet owl will very readily use a nest box. Um, I'm not sure so much about the other species. I don't know if Catherine has an idea. I don't know. Um, I think that when you're putting them up for something like boreal owls, they may be so few and far between that you're you're not super likely to get a boreal owl in there. So I don't know how they feel about nest boxes. Uh, something like a great horned owl definitely won't use a nest box because you need cavity nesters to, to use a nest box. So yes. um, great horned owls build open cup nests. Also, you'd need a very big box. <laughs> a huge box. Huge um, box, yeah. There's just a couple of questions coming in at the very end here uh, that are new. And one is how many babies are normal for an owl? They think they count at least seven in this picture here. So, <laughs> Yeah, this is probably a picture I should also explain. Uh, this was also from the friend who was reintroducing burrowing owls. Uh, burrowing owls do have extremely large clutches, and I think there may have been eight in this photo, but uh, you can see that one guy is sort of squished underneath all of his siblings' feet. Um, I like this photo because it's actually how I feel sometimes when people are asking me questions about a talk, you know, just like, Whoo! Um, so that's why I use it a lot. Uh, these guys are in a cat carrier uh, for banding. Um, I'm actually not sure about the typical clutch size, but I'm imagining probably somewhat smaller for our cavity nesting owls because I don't think uh, that number of owlets would fit nicely in a cavity nest. Um, Jenna, do you know clutch size for owls offhand? Um, I think it varies a lot, but I, I'm pretty sure for great horned, um, I usually see pictures of either two or three fledgling, fledglings uh, per mm -hmm. pair. Um, so definitely not quite so many as in this picture. <laughs> yes, yeah, this was this was an excessive number of baby owls. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a question of, is it true that Costco is utilizing the boreal forest for toilet paper? Um, I don't know the answer to that. But I will just say that a lot of um, forestry operation in softwood forests, which the boreal forest is is often softwoods, are usually used for pulp and paper products as they are in Newfoundland. And so, I mean, it, a lot of boreal forest logging could potentially be used for toilet paper. So I don't know what else to say about that question. <laughs> I mean, I guess we could point out that there are um, sustainable forestry standards, uh, including the uh, what's FSC, forest sustainability, I, I guess, forest sustainability certification and SFI, which is sustainable forest, forestry initiative. Uh, and so um, if you want to be sure that your products are uh, coming from lumber that is sustainably managed and harvested, uh, you can look for those certifications and you can, you can do a little bit of investigating into what each of those certifications mean. Uh, there are a variety of them, but certainly companies that meet those certifications do have to demonstrate that they meet certain standards. Yes, absolutely. Good answer. Um, I think that we've gone through everything um, other than a couple others that I answered in the chat long, long ago. Um, but there is plenty of thanks in here. Uh, great presentation. Lots of great presentations. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you, okay. Catherine. That was very informative tonight. 
Thank you, Jenna. Thank you for uh, monitoring the chat and keeping track of things. And thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, and we will be doing another webinar on Monday, this time about species at risk. So we'll probably be coming back to the short-eared owl again. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking a little bit more about him. Uh, but yes, again, if you're interested in the owl survey and you need some help getting started, just get in touch with me. It's the time of year for the owls. All right, have a good night, everyone. Good night, all.